Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end as we will hold a 30-minute networking session in the neural network. Here you can meet, ask questions to our distinguished speakers, connect, and chat with the AI for Good community. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from me as well. I'm Guillaume martinez Rora from the ITU, and I would like to welcome you all for joining today's AI for Good webinar on reaching a new level in robot touch sensitivity. This session is part of the AI for Good programming track where we discuss the role of autonomous robots in achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We have a distinguished set of panelists today, but as always, we are counting on you, the participants, to help create a very interactive session. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our great moderator today. His name is Carmel Mahidi, and he's the professor of mechanical engineering and director of the Soft Machines Lab at Carnegie Mellon University. Carmel, welcome, and the show is all yours. Thank you so much, Guillaume. It's a real pleasure. A uh, delight to chair this session on robot sensing. Uh, so what you're going to see here is a, a very diverse and inspiring group of presenters who are tackling challenges of robot touch, perception, and haptics. Uh, and they're approaching this from a variety of different scientific perspectives. They come from industry, uh, academia. They have expertise in relevant disciplines of biomechanics, robotics, AI, and materials engineering. Now, although these uh, panelists uh, uh, come from, uh, at different stages in their careers, each one of them have made seminal or pioneering contributions that have advanced the field of robot sensing. However, they're not just driven by solving hard problems in robotics and engineering. They're also driven by a passion uh, to advance sustainability and human well being. So, as you listen uh, to the panel presentation and, and as you engage in the QA session, think about how the work that we're discussing relates to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So think about what's the impact of these technologies on human welfare, economic activity, education, sustainability of our cities and environments. Also think about what new technical advancements we need to further develop uh, in these fields of robot sensing and perception so that we can broaden uh, the societal impact. The first presenter uh, is going to be Dr. Tess Hallebrakers. Uh, she's a research scientist at Meta, formerly known as Facebook. Uh, she works with their AI research team, and she'll be giving an overview uh, of her work on novel approaches to tactile sensing, as well as the bigger role that AI has in robot touch and perception. In Dr. Hellerbrecher's uh, uh, presentation, as you'll see with a lot of the other uh, panel presentations, you'll see this emphasis uh, on new material architectures that enable robot sensing skins to be soft and, de and deformable. The idea here being uh, to make robot interfaces that are more similar uh, in their properties to natural human tissue uh, and, and skin. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Tess. Um, excited to hear your uh, presentation. All right, thank you for your patience while I found the unmute button. And thank you, Guillaume and Carmel, for the introduction. I hope we can all see my slides on the screen. And just to reiterate, my name is Tess, and I am a research scientist at Meta AI specializing in robotic tactile sensing. So today, I am going to introduce one of my more recent works on magnetic tactile sensing in a broad 10 minute overview. Let's get started. Intuitively, I believe everyone here can agree that our skin is a fundamental part of our nervous system. The human sense of touch enables all sorts of complicated tasks like pouring coffee or knitting a blanket. And on top of that, human skin seamlessly integrates with our other four senses to successfully help us navigate completely unstructured environments that make up our daily lives. 
If the sense of touch is so prevalent in our lives, why are electronic sensing skin still so underdeveloped? I believe that one of these reasons is that compared to visual and audio data, touch sensing falls far behind. And one main reason for this is that visual and audio data have relatively good analogs in sensing technology. For example, cameras are ubiquitous at this point and camera data or images are super easy to share and understand. By collecting a huge and diverse set of data visuals, ImageNet paved the way for huge advances in our understanding of computer vision. Um, audio data sets like VoxLib are slightly newer and less common, but it still does a great job at collecting huge and diverse amounts of auditory information. Then where are our large scale touch data sets? There, um, I hypothesize that we haven't been able to build this touch data set because collecting touch data is just far more challenging than audio or visual data. And this is because the sense of touch itself typically requires interacting with the world and the world is a very harsh environment. Then we have a huge challenge in front of us. How can we build a sensing skin that is robust enough to survive the harsh environments while also providing useful information? In this case, what defines a good tactile sensing skin? Very briefly, I'll say that we're using Cuban skin as our reference model. So we want our skin to be conformal. It should also be covering large areas and be thin enough to not interfere with underlying motions. And it should also respond quickly enough to our inputs and also be regenerative since we are dealing with that harsh environment. From a robotics and AI perspective, we also need a design that is low cost so we can have many, many implementations out into the world. It should be data rich so we can collect enough useful information and it should also be data reusable so we can build and share all the data we have collected. To address these needs, I will go over some previous work on a magnetic tactile sensor we now call Reskin. Reskin is a magnetic tactile sensor that maps changes in magnetic flux to deformation. And this is useful because magnetic flux can be measured without any wires, increasing the mechanical robustness of our sensor. It also means that the soft material can be replaced without any electronic changes. So this is key because soft materials and fabrics, just like our running shoes or clothing, are guaranteed to wear down over time. Let's take a look at the kind of information we can get from a magnetic tactile sensor. The magnetic sensor has two main modes. One is proximity due to the surrounding magnetic field. And the second one is deformation due to the displacement of internal magnetic microparticles. For our first example, we're using the proximity signal to pick up a key and insert it into a lock. These are very precise tasks that require reliable and consistent location information. We can expand this idea more broadly. Let's consider how this skill could help robots navigate complicated hazardous environments and allow humans to step out into safer zones of operation. Here's another quick example of where the sensor provides gentle force feedback to control individual drops of water from a plastic pipette. In this case, I could imagine using robotic tactile sensing for processing medical samples, perhaps increasing the throughput of our results, decreasing the room for potential errors, and also handling potentially hazardous biomaterials. One issue we will always face with these soft materials is that they degrade over time in use. If we want truly accessible, shareable tactile technology, we need to know how to replace the skin with minimal effort. And then additionally, if we can relate one sensing skin to another, we can start building a shared network of data that we can build new knowledge from as technology progresses. Um, our most recent work shows how a multi-sensor neural network is used to map magnetic flux to both XY location and force. So in this work, we show that the multi-sensor model reduces error by 88% for XY location and 63% for force estimation. I do wanna acknowledge that this is kind of naive, just add more data so that you can get a more general model, but in, this is often not done in practice because of how difficult it is to one, make the sensors and to collect this amount of data. So these properties of Reskin is really what allowed us to get to this next level. Um, additionally, 
Further adaptation of the model by adding triplet loss shows a 30% improvement in XY and an 8% improvement in force over the multi-sensor model. Okay. Here we put two reskin sensors onto a two-finger parallel gripper robot. A simple threshold is met with reskin to lift the blueberry, and then my collaborator intentionally damages the skin and swaps it out for a new one. This way you can continue to lift as many blueberries as you would like without any system resets or recalibration. And this is only possible because the magnetic sensing skin is physically separate from the magnetic sensing electronics. This means that we can swap the, out the part that degrades with little to no knowledge of our full system, which I think makes it way more accessible for people getting started in tactile sensing. To emphasize the need for this kind of delicate force feedback, I'm also just gonna share a quick video of what it looks like when you try to use the onboard force sensing for the same task. So especially for purposes in agriculture, medical or human robot interaction, this kind of delicate tactile feedback is required for our systems. One of my favorite properties of Reskin is how easy it is to integrate into different form factors. The raw data is streaming here at the top and the three axis flux information is visualized on the right. So uh, on the left hand side, I took my dog out to campus and put a reskin sensor into the sole of her shoe. And then the sensor tracks her three axis gate contact forces while she explores. I encourage you to brainstorm your own ideas on how the sensor can be used. And I would be super happy to discuss any details uh, after this talk. Uh, at the very beginning of this talk, I mentioned that human skin is a great reference model to look at, but we also know that human skin is not just one sensor, it's a combination of many specialized neurons. I hypothesize that the diversity is key to understanding deeply complex and unstructured environments. As a very quick overview, we know that sensory neurons differ in many ways, including both their location and also sensitivity. However, for all of these differences, they also overlap. And I think this overlap introduces a key feature we're looking to towards the future, which is redundancy. I, I believe that redundancy will be very important for future sensing skin designs. And we'll have a chance to hear about some other great technologies that will contribute to our available options uh, in just a few minutes. And finally, just to wrap up here, I strongly believe that a lot of innovation is going to come in the space between AI and soft sensing. Um, just a quick overview, I think AI can help us learn how to generalize patterns across these tactile sensors, as well as decipher any patterns that come up in our larger scale data sets. And then on the other side, sensing scans will ultimately be the, what enables adaptive technology that can be deployed in the real world. Uh, yep, that was my quick 10 minute overview. Thank you so much for joining us today and special thanks to my collaborators, Ranak, Abhinav, and Abhinav Gupta and Carmel Maji, just to name a few. So at this time, I'm gonna pass it back to Carmel. Thanks so much, Tess, very exciting work. Um, so uh, and also really eager to get more into to, to some of your work and thoughts uh, during the Q&A session. Um, so let's uh, move on uh, to uh, Professor Ravinder Daya. He is a uh, professor of electronics and nanoengineering at the University of Glasgow. Um, so feel free to go ahead and uh, share a screen and excited to hear your work on tactile and electronic skins. Uh, thank you very much, Carmel. Can you confirm if my screen is visible? Yep, we can see it. Okay, thank you very much again. So uh, I would start by highlighting why tactile skin is, uh, is so important. Uh, look at this animation, this small experiment. Try putting your hand on the ice block for some time and then grasp an object nearby. You will see that you, uh, because of the temporary losing sensory, uh, touch sensory uh, modality, you can see object will slip out of hand. Uh, you can see this is happening, but there's nothing much you can do about it because of the low sensory feelings. And that raises an important question uh, for us. Why are we developing uh, machines and prosthetic limbs without sense of touch? This is also important in case of automation sector where robots work in cages and, by, uh, and no human is allowed in this area. And by chance, if any human enters into this space, 
we also come across news such as this one. So why would a robot uh, not work in a, in a, uh, allow us a safe environment, particularly when we are looking at uh, industry four where robotics is involving and we expect robot and human to be working uh, close to each other as co-workers. So uh, if that's the case, then that it highlights the importance of, uh, of touch sensing, but also interactive machines. Uh, uh, there are several other applications uh, mainly related to health where uh, touch sensing plays an important role. If you look on the left hand side, there are some uh, current uh, pull factors and on the right hand side, uh, so the, on the left hand side, there are current push factors on the right hand side, there are certain pull factors and most of these have been uh, are connected to health, which is also one of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, health and well-being. So on the left hand side, you see some applications where touch sensing is not used today, such as the Vinci robot that you see here, where surgeon is sitting and looking at a console and trying to operate, but without touch sensing, touch uh, tactile sensing uh, feedback. If there was tactile feedback here or haptic feedback here, the surgery would become better. Likewise, in case of uh, minimal invasive surgery, currently tools that are used they don't have any, any sense of touch. They don't allow pressure map. They don't allow doctors to palpate. If the extended feeling uh, that doctors may have through a sense of touch, then it will improve the, the, the surgical uh, interventions will become better. Likewise, uh, in current scenario, as you can see on the right-hand side, a doctor trying to uh, you know, palpate a tablet provided the tablet had haptic interface or a display, which allows vibrotactile feedback or some other type of feedback and allows then doctors to, to remotely uh, feel the body of, uh, of, the, uh, of the patient. And that uh, takes, uh, in current context, when COVID, in, uh, in, in the current context, when we are not allowed to, 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 to be close to each other, this, this becomes very important. And likewise, you can see a soft robotic uh, limb where allowing, which is controlled uh, with brain and allowing an elderly person or a disabled person to, to improve some quality of life because of aging or because of other reasons. And at the center, there are all these questions uh, that we need to answer. For example, what makes different surfaces feel differently to touch? how my skin and brain work to give this rich experience. What if I lose touch sensing? Can I make artificial tools to regain lost sensory feelings? Can I make artificial tools to extend sensory feelings? And how can I recreate my own perceptual experience? So all these questions are then answered through, uh, through electronic skin. Uh, electronic skin, I must say, or tactile sensing is, is different from other sensory modalities in a sense that it is not centralized. We don't have two, uh, unlike two eyes or two ears, says uh, skin is distributed all over the body. And that also allows us to, to measure a, or, or experience a range of parameters such as temperature, cold, soft object, hard object, glossy surface or, or smooth surface. For these, you need different type of sensors distributed all over the body and that uh, makes it a challenging problem as well as an exciting problem. Further, we have to look at the, the, the technology bottlenecks today. So the question is most of the electronics that we come across is planar. And if we have to use planar electronics, then our robot should be designed in, in something similar as shown on the, on the screen now. But most of the real world objects as well as uh, robots that we are developing these days they have curvy surfaces and that means uh, uh, the one has to think about the technology, one has to think about how electronics need to be done so that it conforms to the body and on large areas. Furthermore, you have to deal with the data and energy. Large number of sensors present over the body means they, they will generate a lot of data. Previous speaker mentioned about AI. So one possibility is to use the, the AI technique or machine learning techniques after you have uh, collected the data. That's most of the research uh, uh, is going on these days. But other possibility is to have the data processing at the, at the, sense, at the point of sensing itself, to scale down the data and then uh, apply any machine learning algorithm. Currently, that's area where uh, we are also focusing on. So in terms of energy, 
uh, one can see that large number of sensors, associated electronics, all of these will require energy. And often we come across that large area tactile skin is energy sink and that people highlight as one of the challenges. But it is also an opportunity and I'll take you uh, in a couple of minutes, I'll show you a video which shows that it can become an opportunity just because it is present on large area. So coming back to the first part I was mentioning, uh, how do we get uh, electronics on, on uh, flexible substrates so that it can conform to the large area or curvy surfaces. This animation shows one technique where you can use the current silicon based approach uh, and transfer print some of the, these nanostructures on planar substrate or flexible substrates. And then you can process once they are transferred on flexible substrates, these ultra thin layers can be further processed to obtain transistors and, uh, and complex circuitry, which can then either be some of these transistors could become the sensor themselves and rest of the circuit can be used to process the, the data that you're collecting. And this is what we are following as, as, as an approach. We call it printed tactile skin, and, uh, and uh, actually it is neuromorphic printed tactile skin, which has a, a layer underneath the back plane is nanowire printed devices. And when I say devices, these are transistors and they are covered with soft uh, uh, transducer layer. So when you press the transducer layer, there will be change in the resistance, which is represented here in the symbol form. This change in the resistance will lead to change in the current in the transistor. And that's how you modulate the transistor, uh, uh, the, the transistor output. So by, by pressing the, the certain point, you can change the output of the transistor, which can then be further processed by the local uh, uh, electronics present uh, close to the sensor. And you can scale down the data. One way to do that is using devices such as the one shown here, which has a multiple gates and it has a floating gate uh, and on top of that you have multiple gate and these are realized on a on a nano wire that you see here on the screen now these each gate they have a, a they are they have a different width you can see here and that width is decided by the the weights that you can have in a neural network so like synaptic uh, uh, junction that you have here so presynaptic neuron they come and summation takes place and based on if the summation is above the threshold, the signal is transferred further. Likewise, in this case, you have multiple gates. If they are connected, they are excited all at the same time. And these gates could be connected to different touch sensors. If the overall output is greater than threshold, transistor will fire, otherwise, or will be switched on, otherwise it will not work. And these are some of the responses when uh, different gates are, are, uh, are switched on or excited. So that way you can combine within the device itself, you can combine some behavior, some learning also, and some synaptic behavior can be incorporated into the device itself. And this, when scaled up, can become a, a, a hardware implemented uh, neuromorphic skin, which is obtained by printing. I mentioned about energy. Uh, in this context, we have uh, recently reported the, this work where we use solar cells to generate the, the energy. You can see commercial solar cells are used here. They, are, uh, they were cut in, in one centimeter size and they were placed on uh, soft PDMS. So this integration then works in, in such a way that when you press the solar cell, it will not generate energy. And that simple concept is used to identify contact or no contact. So when a user comes in proximity, uh, there will be shadow on the, on the solar cells. The amount of energy uh, it generates will reduce and that indicates the proximity. So this way we are able, we were able to show that the skin can be, uh, can become a source of energy also. It's a net generation of energy in this case. And if you scale it to, to the large area, if you cover entire body of the, of the robot, you will be able to generate so much of power that some of the motors can be operated as well. So in conclusion, I would like to say that tactile sensing is important for safe human machine uh, interaction and that applies to inanimate world as well. Distributed sensing, computing, energy, they are all needed for effective use of electronic skin in applications such as bionics, robotics, internet of things, wearable systems, etc. Exploiting the large area of electronic skin for energy generation is a promising cost effective approach to meet uh, energy requirement uh, for the applications mentioned above. 
and power management, neuromorphic computing, uh, particularly at the hardware level itself, and low power electronics, they all can complement the advances uh, attained through electronic skin. Uh, I would quickly like to acknowledge the support I have got from my funders as well as my uh, group members, which uh, my group is Bendable Electronics and Sensing Technologies Group. And that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you very much. I pass to Carmel again. All right. Thank you so much, Robin. R really exciting work. Um, so uh, let's uh, let's move on with the panel. So next we have uh, uh, Professor Benjamin T. Uh, so he's on the faculty in the material science and engineering at National University of Singapore, uh, and he'll be presenting a lot of his very exciting work on uh, pioneering electronic skin technologies with a focus on, on approaching the performance of natural human skin and in part doing that through novel materials and also uh, uh, integration of AI. So Benjamin, please. Great, thank you Carmel for the kind introduction and also the organizers for putting together this very exciting panel and all the speakers today. Uh, I will talk about AI skins for good and I hope that fits quite nicely with the theme which is AI for good. And I'm from the National University of Singapore. And it's uh, close to midnight right now. So if I'm somewhat incoherent, beg your forgiveness. I'm sure we are all at many different time zones. So when you lose your sense of touch, it becomes debilitating. Here's an actual example where a volunteer was asked to light a matchstick. Most of you probably would have done that before. Now, if we actually inject some lidocaine, which is a chemical to numb the nerves carrying the signals from the skin to the brain, the same action of lighting a matchstick would take significantly longer. In fact, it takes more than five times longer. And this is in the presence of vision as well. Therefore, the skin is a critical organ for you to manipulate objects, which on a daily basis, if you think about it, is about probably 90% of the task you do every day, uh, basically once you're awake, right? And so, for example, this volunteer takes more than five times longer the time to light a matchstick. So robots at the same time are yet unable to match human capabilities in terms of grasping action, which is why the many excellent works and pioneering works by the speakers today are trying to create technologies that can help solve this problem. And they all have very uh, useful uh, performance in different areas. Uh, in this case, I have a video showing a robot hand, essentially without sensors, unable to grasp a uh, apple from a box. And this is challenging and the, and the robot continues this action um, even though it sees that it's not happening because it doesn't have the sense of touch. So the challenge with building really good electronic skins lies at the interface between many different sciences from materials to electronics to systems engineering as well as biology to understanding how the human skin and our brain and nervous system works. So my lab is the sensors.ai labs, and we sit at the interface between sensors and AI by utilizing knowledge from across multiple disciplines. I will briefly mention uh, some specialized uh, capabilities of human skin, especially from a speed point of view, as the earlier speaker have mentioned that the skin contains many highly specialized cells that performs different types of sensitivity uh, functions. And the skin is also part of a system not just from the external interface, but all the way to your brain, because the signals needs to be transmitted often through the central, uh, the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system, which is your brain, and then to the muscles in order for you to actuate and move them appropriately for the task you're thinking of doing. Other challenges with using soft materials that behave like skin is this uh, material property we call viscoelasticity, and all of us have skin that are highly viscoelastic, but we have a lot of sensors to be able to compensate for this viscoelasticity. Such property actually reduces the possible speed that is, the, the materials can react when compressed after the first time. As you can see, it takes some time to return to its original shape. In order to solve this, we can engineer materials uh, by designing them to have very low viscoelasticity. And here I plot typical materials which have high viscoelasticity or as evidenced by the uh, difference in these two graphs here. Whereas we can design you know, intelligence directly into the material to reduce this window significantly 
and our work actually can create materials that have very low viscoelasticity, but yet have high sensitivity. So in some sense, this is perhaps a little better than what human skins can do. Another aspect of human skin is its ability to scale to many, many different sensors. As Professor Ravinder that he had pointed out earlier, there are many sensors across the body working all the time. And in order to solve this speed and scalability dilemma, the human system has basically utilized digital signals such as your nervous system using action potentials. And this allows it to scale uh, to hundreds of thousands of sensors and yet operate at the same time. However, in order to scale to such capabilities, uh, current strategies to develop electronic skins, you know, uh, we need to also consider the ability to have asynchronous or in parallel performance. That is why we were looking at this problem and uh, came up with a technique we call uh, ACES, which basically mimics the ability of human skin to transmit the data in parallel. As a result, our data can be transmitted uh, in parallel to hundreds of thousands of sensors without sacrificing speed. In fact, it is still a thousand times faster than what human skins can operate at. And this was published recently in a journal Science Robotics. What this allows us to do and the machines uh, to do is that we can then use our materials that are very sensitive, uh, but at the same time, utilize machine learning algorithms to very quickly classify object properties. For example, here I show different curvatures of objects uh, when compressed using an electronic skin and our parallel system. You can see that the classification is much faster in terms of uh, seconds after contact and also more accurate compared to other types of approaches that are not in parallel. The same thing can happen even if the objects were the same shape but different hardness or softness. Here is a hard material versus a soft material. We achieve high classification accuracy uh, after a very short time of less than 10 milliseconds compared to slower systems. So this is important. Uh, and we have now published a data set using such a system uh, akin to the vision uh, analog of uh, hand handwritten digits. And so we have actually handwritten pressure maps that is uh, published in our archive. If you're interested, feel free to take a look at the data set and try to run uh, different machine learning algorithms on it uh, that uh, is using the represent representation of uh, nervous systems. So why is this important? It turns out that um, you know, we have many amputees uh, due to chronic diseases as well as accidents. In Singapore alone where I live, we have four amputations a day in 2017. And, and today, globally, there's over a million amputations every year. That means there's one amputation happening every 30 seconds. Now that is incredible and we are unable as yet to replace the human limb with a close to human like one that the person has lost. Uh, and we are therefore looking at equipping prosthetic devices with our electronic skins, right? Uh, for example, incorporating them into uh, neural interfaces where they can actually control robotic devices of machines and actually feel the sensation when they are contacting the objects, giving them a more lifelike replacement. At the same time, electronic skins can be used for healthcare applications. Uh, for example, recreating the sense of touch on a human fingertip can allow us to potentially measure your eye pressure or intraocular pressure for a monitoring of glaucoma, which blinds over a million people every year because they do not know that eye pressure has increased. Using such a simple system, are we able to show that the person can use such these skins at home and monitor their own intraocular eye pressure. So this uh, was recently won the James Dyson Foundation International Award. Uh, at the same time, as we develop all these amazing electronic skin technologies, we will eventually face the problem of waste. And therefore we have to look at other solutions that can incorporate intelligence into the system uh, where they can enter the e-skin system where they can self repair just like human skin. And here I show some materials that can allow us to heal uh, autonomously without energy input. So you can see the scar disappear over time at room temperature. These are some of the things we can incorporate intelligence into materials uh, to create AI skins for good. And I would like to thank my group members for uh, you know, doing all the amazing work. And I'm really speaking on behalf of them. And also of course the funding agencies for the work and the UN SDG goals uh, that I think electron skin can play a big role in 
uh, some of the ones I have uh, boxed up here. And I hope that many of you will be interested to pursue uh, an education uh, in science and technology and improve uh, the whole world for the benefit of humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, uh, very inspiring work. Um, so uh, this is uh, just a reminder to folks, uh, if you uh, have questions for the panelists, uh, uh, please um, uh, click on the video uh, wall tab uh, and then just go uh, um, post your questions there. Uh, and I, I can ask those during the Q&A session. So the last uh, panel uh, presentation is going to be by uh, Professor Marsha O'Malley. Uh, she's a professor of mechanical engineering at Rice University and, and works in uh, uh, biomechanics and, and um, um, uh, prosthetics. And uh, she'll be presenting also on her work on wearable haptic feedback. Um, so um, Marsha, if you'd like to go ahead and do share screen. All right, I think I've got the share screen. I just oh. need to, oh. Give me just a second. I need to, one more thing. All right. So um, thanks a lot, uh, Carmel and uh, Guillaume for the invitation to participate. The talks have been great and I'm uh, really excited to share uh, our own work from, from here. So um, I'm into haptics. Um, my research lab designs devices that recreate the sense of touch for humans. So my perspective is a little bit different than the previous speakers that you've heard um, who are interested more in providing the sense of touch to robots. So to me, touch is really our most fascinating sense. And why is that? Well, first, touch is bidirectional. So when we look at a painting or listen to music, we can appreciate it, but we can't change the brush strokes or alter the audio with our senses. But with touch, we can manipulate the world around us and what we feel depends on our touch interactions. Second, touch is multifaceted. So you're gonna see the third version of this figure today. Uh, we have many different types of sensors or mechanoreceptors in our skin. Some of these respond to slip and help with grip control when we manipulate objects. Some respond to pressure and help us sense shape, texture, and edges. Still others are programmed to respond to vibration or roughness. And, and the fourth type, um, Ruffini endings, are programmed to uh, help, I'm sorry, help us detect skin stretch and the direction of forces on the skin as we uh, feel objects sliding over our skin. By the way, Marsha, sorry to interrupt, but you have yeah. a, a, the Zoom uh, window is, uh, one of the Zoom windows are open. I think this is the, uh, if you could just minimize that, um, it's blocking part of the screen. All right, I'm going to fix that. I think I just had a disconnect and reconnect. Um, nothing like live Zoom uh, to make this work. So give me just okay. a second to get things off the screen. That's perfect. Actually, it's perfect as it is now. Okay, <laughs> great. So, um, so when we think about how to transmit touch sensations to users, which is really uh, the part of, of this haptics and robot touch sensing that interests me, you have a lot of different touch mechanisms that can be used to encode information. And this creates both opportunities and challenges for us as engineers. So for the past few years, my lab has been interested in how we can communicate complex information to human users via wearable haptic devices. There are a range of different applications where this might be useful. So we could receive messages from our in-home robotic vacuums telling us it's time to charge, we might get intuitive instructions when navigating the Houston highways, or we could enhance our Zoom calls with haptic exchanges. And there are several engineering challenges that my group is trying to address. First, we want to uh, explore what information is important to convey to the user. And second, what is the right device or haptic cue to provide that substitutive haptic feedback? So uh, in the next few minutes, I'm going to present a few different research efforts in my lab that illustrate these challenges. So here's one example. Amputees are using advanced prosthetic devices, but they often have to rely on their visual sense to observe the shape of the artificial hand and to infer the interaction forces between the artificial hand and objects in the environment. So in this video, we've um, outfitted our amputee with the Rice Haptic Rocker. It's up here on her uh, left arm. This is a wearable device that stretches the skin from side to side much like how your skin stretches over your knuckles when you grasp and release objects. So here our participant, who is a transradial amputee, 
is using the touch feedback from the rocker to improve her dexterity when using this advanced prosthesis. Without the haptic rocker, she would have to rely solely on vision to determine the pose of the hand and the strength of her grasp. In another scenario, we wanna provide performance feedback to surgical trainees to improve their skill. We've been collaborating with Houston Methodist Hospital, which I'm very fortunate to have right across the street from me, on aspects of training in endovascular surgery. So endovascular surgery, surgery is a minimally invasive procedure that enables doctors to treat vascular conditions while minimizing trauma. It's accomplished by navigating these flexible catheters and guide wires, which are introduced into a small incision in the groin, which gives access to the femoral artery. And then by feeding these guide wires and catheters through the vessels, they're able to reach the treatment area. These devices, these guide wires and catheters have different physical properties, and they must be manipulated in tandem to navigate this complicated vasculature. So you can see our individual here, they're advancing the guide wire, they're twisting, they're manipulating these tools to try and access that point of interest. I've tried this myself, don't worry, only in simulation, and it's a really difficult procedure to learn. Trainees receive a really limited amount of feedback, and this feedback comes from an expert observer. You can actually see that expert observer here in the background looking over the shoulder of the trainee, maybe making some notes or, or filling out a score sheet. But this feedback can be subjective in nature, and it rarely tells these trainees how to do the task better. So because the surgical environment is visually crowded already and operating rooms are noisy, we're using the sense of touch to provide real-time performance feedback. Our approach is to monitor trainees as they perform tasks on a surgical simulator. Then we stream data that tracks the movements of the surgical tools. From these data, we compute performance metrics known to correlate with expertise. Then we um, generate vibrotactile haptic cues based on the observed performance. And we provide these haptic cues to the trainee in real time uh, on a wearable device that they're already comfortable with and observe how this feedback influences their performance. Our hope is that we can speed up the um, process of skill acquisition or even improve overall performance outcomes. We've also explored how we can map complex information like speech to multimodal haptic cues. We had talked about the wide range of mechanoreceptors that are in the skin. And so we're trying to take advantage of that to transmit high density information. And we're doing that by combining different kinds of cues in a single device. So here you see our device called Missive. It's a multi-sensory interface of squeeze, stretch, and vibration elements that's worn on the arm. To successfully communicate via wearable haptic devices like Missive, individuals must not only reliably perceive the cues themselves, but they must also learn the mapping between these complex cues and the information they encode. So here's our missive device that encodes phonemes, which are defined as any of the perceptually distinct units of sound that distinguish one word from another. So here you see the cue stretch off, squeeze on, and top tactor with a long vibration. So we need our participants to accurately perceive this cue, and then they need to translate this cue to its phonemic counterpart. Here, the sound ah is an awful. In some studies, we showed that users can more accurately perceive cues that are comprised of this range of different haptic uh, sensations rather than all one type, such as in large vibration arrays. We also demonstrated that users could recall with about 90% accuracy a vocabulary of over 100 words built with these haptic phonemes with just 100 minutes of training. This really shows the potential for conveying information-rich messages in these compact wearable haptic devices. So I've got a couple videos here. Here you can see that first part of the problem, which is accurately perceiving the cue. So we have a user identifying the multi-sensory haptic cue components that are conveyed to the arm through missive. And uh, they're feeling some combination of skin stretch, squeeze, and different vibration patterns. And then using this visual interface to indicate their responses so that we can measure their performance. Once we've ver verified that they can um, accurately perceive those cues, then we go about uh, training them to map those to phonemes. So this video shows a user playing phonemic haptic cues in sequence, and then identifying the word that is comprised of those haptic tokens. 
So they click to play each phoneme, which they feel on their arm through missive. They identify the pattern, they know the mapping, and they're able to build that into uh, words as part of their vocabulary. So the final application I wanna highlight is providing haptic feedback when interacting with virtual objects. So in addition to all of these applications that I presented, I really want people to be able to feel objects that do not physically exist. It's increasingly important that we address haptic feedback so that we can close the action confirmation loop in virtual and augmented reality systems. We also wanna provide individuals with the most information possible so that we perform at high levels in these environments. And of course, we wanna enhance immersion. So we've been working in collaboration with Meta, formerly Facebook Reality Labs, to develop wearable haptic devices that can convey realistic haptic or touch feedback to users interacting with objects in either virtual or augmented reality. So maybe you have your own experience with commercial haptic devices. They tend to be like these basic handheld controllers, which though inexpensive, offer a low degree of haptic fidelity, typically just simple vibration cues. At the other end of the spectrum are extremely expensive and bulky haptic gloves that offer believable interactions, but with their own drawbacks of weight and cost. So uh, we sought to develop a device somewhere in the middle of the spectrum, and we went with a bracelet design that has the advantage of leaving the hands free to interact in augmented reality, also being all day wearable and socially acceptable in public. So we created this device called TASB. It's a tactile and squeeze bracelet interface. As its name implies, TASB can deliver vibrotactile feedback to six different discrete locations around the wrist. This gives us an advantage over existing vibrational controllers and that we can, can, we can program richer and higher throughput cues for our users. TASB's most interesting feature, I think, is its ability to squeeze, to apply pressure uh, uh, to the wrist as well. And it's the second haptic modality that allows us to provide proportional feedback for interactions where vibrations are not well, well suited, where we have continuous interactions with an object. So let's take a look at squeeze in action. So uh, here's TASB, uh, as you would see the action around the wrist. In this video, the squeeze actuator is being commanded to follow sinusoidal motion. You can see this motion now also on the arm. And one thing that's really um, special about TASB is the ability to squeeze without these modules sliding over the skin. So it's a really pure normal force that's applied to the wrist. By combining squeeze and vibration with pseudo haptic effects, TASB can deliver believable and intuitive substitutions for hand interaction forces with virtual objects. Now the selection of appropriate haptic cues that are provided in response to user action and accurately perceived by the user are really critical aspects to creating an interaction that's convincing and believable that you're actually touching these virtual objects when there's nothing interacting with your fingertip at all. So let me share just a couple of videos that illustrate uh, the function. Our approach to creating believable interactions has three parts. First, haptic vibrations render discrete events, such as hand collisions, impacts, and high-frequency content. Second, we use proportional squeeze for continuous forces, such as object stiffness, weight, and inertia. Finally, visual pseudo-haptic effects manipulate the virtual hand position to give the illusion that certain actions require more physical effort. Let's take a look at some examples. In this button interaction, vibration is rendered when the user contacts the button surface and fully depresses it. Squeeze increases as the button is pressed to convey a spring stiffness. In fact, by increasing the rate of squeeze and the intensity of the pseudo haptic effect together, it is possible to make buttons that feel harder to press. Vibration, squeeze, and visual pseudo haptics can be applied to other motions such as pulling and twisting. TASB is most compelling when haptic feedback is provided on both hands. This is especially true for two-handed interactions that simulate reactive forces between the hands, such as this bow and arrow example. So we envision a range of different applications for risk-based haptic feedback in virtual and augmented reality. For example, we can provide haptic feedback when manipulating objects, 
for user interfaces, social interactions, gaming, training, and many more applications. And I'm really excited about the developments that are, were presented in the previous talks on new sensing capabilities and new uh, actuation approaches. And I'm, I'm really uh, interested in diving into how we can combine these technologies and really leverage uh, the human as part of the system uh, in providing the sense of touch. I wanna thank my current students and the sources of support that I discussed today. And I really look forward to our upcoming discussion. Thanks so much, uh, Marsha, for a really inspiring work. Uh, um, and so uh, let's see. So just uh, again, please, if you have questions from, from any of the uh, panel presentations, just uh, post those on the video wall uh, and, and I can go ahead and ask. So at this point, uh, I think let's uh, now turn it over to the panel for, for a Q&A. Uh, so if all the panelists like to go ahead and um, uh, 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 turn on their video, uh, turn on their cameras. All right, so um, so again, really exciting work, and um, you know I have you know, questions for for kind of you know individual panelists, but but also just as a group, uh, I'd kind of like to to hear from everyone. Uh, maybe for this first question, uh, we can just go in order of of uh, the presentations um, and just tell me what have been the big breakthroughs in recent decades uh, that have been really enabling for you to be able to do what you can do so why is it that we can do this now and we couldn't do this five years ago or 10 years ago or you know several decades ago so so what were kind of some of those recent big breakthroughs um so so tess let's let's start with you yeah, the first thing that comes to my mind is cell phone technology. I feel like I'm often borrowing from their development and scale for my own microelectronics, and they've just helped us measure a lot of things. So, uh, cell phones use capacitive screens, and I can use those same capacitive measurement modules for my sensing skins. Uh, cameras getting smaller and better. The magnetometer I use is straight out of a cell phone um, design um, and IMU. So I think all of these kinds of very small, low power sensing has been incredibly enabling for our design of robot sensing skins. Very cool. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Ravinder, how about you? Oh, uh, well, I would say these are the uh, functional materials and the way we, we are able to realize electronics on, uh, on uh, diverse, you know, different type of substrates. Uh, soft and flexible substrates. That's that has made a difference to to the research in electronic skin. Excellent, Benjamin. Sure. I think uh, multiple fronts, but I think the most important perhaps has been the development of semiconductor science and technology. Right, really allowing computation now to be essentially uh, at near zero cost. I think essentially. Uh, and basically, that's propelled all kinds of systems to be made, and we can now use computers to design materials uh, a lot faster, right? So that, that personally, I think it's sort of uh, what the exponential ability, I mean, the growth in the speed and, and also exponential decrease in cost of uh, microelectronics. Great, excellent. And, and Marsha, how about you? Yeah, so I, absolutely all the things that have been mentioned because it's allowing us to sort of package devices in wearable form factor. But I think kind of another aspect is just, um, user acceptance of wearable technologies, right? We, we have our phones in our pockets, we want our notifications, our smartwatches, you know, mine's gonna tell me to stand up and walk around. Um, we're just really accepting now of these kinds of um, really almost intimate uh, wearable devices that, that are always giving us information. And I think because the proliferation of that has been fairly low fidelity, it's really opening up the field of haptics and maybe lowering expectations, which is a good thing, right? So when we started in the field of haptics, we were trying to make these really highly realistic virtual renderings. They were all like feeling the uh, world through a probe. And we were really focused on like accurately recreating uh, realistic environments. And I think this notion of shifting to wearables is uh, giving us a bit more liberty to get away with lower fidelity feedback that still enhances the user experience. Right. And, and Marsha, kind of, on, you know, on this you know, topic of, of haptics or, or even just kind of, you know, more generally kind of tactile sensing, I mean, you know, we've seen all these different material architectures and approaches to, to, to tactile sensing and, and, you know, they all kind of have their, you know, definitely, certainly they have their advantages, 
Um, but, you know, it doesn't seem like that there's kind of like a one size fits all, you know, type of, of tactile sensor technology. So kind of as a as an end user, you know, when you kind of develop these haptic interfaces or, you know, use this kind of in, in human machine interaction, you know, what are, what are the kind of the different considerations in terms of, you know, how you select these different technologies and how does that impact your design? Yeah, this is a this is a real challenge. Like we we definitely, you know, if you're trying to make something compact, you have a limited set of you know, actuation technologies that you can use. And you really need to think about this mapping of what is being sensed to what is being displayed. I guess at the most fundamental level, we try and categorize like discrete events versus continuous events. And thinking about, you know, vibration is really great for a discrete event because over time, our um, mechanoreceptors in the skin become sort of dulled to that uh, repeat vibration. So leaving those for contact for that crisp, you know, you've, you've manipulated or you've touched an object and then relying on these continuous types of cues, be it skin stretch or squeezing or pressure applying. Um, and I, I think the real, maybe the, the playground to, to uh, explore is, do those mappings need to be um, true to the source of the data, right? So do we need to sort of take texture data and render it as vibrations, or can we think about other alternate mappings that um, open up the design space? Right. And here's kind of a kind of going above that. I mean, you know, this is a general question for the panel. Um, you know, are there is there interest in kind of like superhuman, you know, tactile sensing? I mean, are we is it is it most meaningful to kind of mimic kind of the you know kind of human sensing capabilities, you know, or or are there are kind of other types of sensing modalities out there that that you think could be used kind of within a human machine interaction context or just in robotics in general. Um, so, uh, Robin or Ben, Tess, feel free to jump in here. Um, any thoughts on that? Oh, well, uh, uh, Carmel, not just in context with robotics, but also in generally, you know, there are so many skin like tattoos that we come across, which are, you know, having, uh, you know, sensors, not just the physical sensors, such as uh, pressure or temperature sensor, but also chemical sensors. Uh -huh which allow us to measure the parameters we have, we, on our own, we are not able to. Uh, as an example, you may, you, from sweat pH, you can get the measure of glucose and you can then connect it to the diabetes. So those are the, uh, the new features that electronic skin, when you put in context with humans, you, you, can, you can realize. And they are also connected to larger sustainable development goals. As an example, in these wearable form factors, if you, if you are able to, just measure the glucose from sweat, you don't really have to go through this painful uh, prick test, you know, taking blood samples all the time. And this also helps us overcome some of the uh, traditional bottlenecks, either they are bureaucratic bottlenecks, you know, in, in the health sector in certain areas, certain parts of the world, where you can use these wearable systems to, to measure health parameters and transmit them remotely, take a, you know, uh, whatever diagnostic measure is needed and then you can uh, you can follow up after that yeah right no very good points i think um yeah just adding on i think you know uh it'd be interesting right i mean when we first thought about self-healing uh, skins right i mean the natural thing was uh, well it looks like uh, you created wolverine right in some sense uh, x-man um i think there are certain uh, opportunities here to really use such new designs or materials that can self-repair Right, naturally from an environment standpoint. Um, but I think, is there a use for it? I think that really depends on um, the situation that we, we want to use it for, right? In certain extreme environments, uh, you know, if we're talking about space exploration or, or other types of uh, land operations that might be difficult for humans to access, having that superhuman capability, right, uh, can provide hopefully uh, machines to operate better and more autonomously so that humans don't have to do the dangerous task, right? Uh, and instead kind of offload that to a robot or machine to do, right? So having this superhuman capability might be uh, very interesting, very uh, unique environments, right? That are not uh, usual that we experienced. And, and this can happen in all kinds of land operations, not just space. Right. Yeah, I also agree that while human skin is a great model, it's not the end goal. 
I think we can definitely go for superhuman properties. And I think the two that came to mind would be uh, recall. So, you know, we can't recall memories perfectly, but ideally our, our robots can recall, you know, past video images and sensing. And the second would be the fact that the robots are gonna be able to quantify their senses. And I think that's meant for sharing. So we know how to make a fist and how to spread out our palm, but we don't really know how to easily compare that sensation across humans. But we can compare those numbers across systems. And I think that will be really interesting future work. Great. So, you know, what I think kind of, you know, more broadly about, you know, combining AI, well, the role of AI in, in kind of robot sensing, right? I mean, I tend to, in my mind, maybe a little bit too simplistically, decouple the AI, the, you know, the machine learning, the signal processing, from the actual material architectures themselves that collect the, the, the sensory data. Um, however, I mean, you know, especially kind of uh, Benjamin and, and Tess, the work that you're doing, I do kind of see almost this kind of, you know, emerging, you know, where there's AI kind of engineered into the material itself. Um, so either, either, one, either of you want to comment on that? Um, Benjamin, I mean, uh, kind of what, what is your kind of thinking about kind of embodying the intelligence and the AI into the material itself? Yeah, I think that's, that's a really interesting question, right? I mean, right now, I think most people are familiar with AI as lines of code, right? Where you essentially just tell the computer to recognize objects, right, uh, through some data set. Um, but I think that we can expand the idea of artificial intelligence um, by actually incorporating them into physical objects. Like for example, the self-healing material is one of, one of the examples. The ability to sense uh, and, and magnetic fields uh, such as the one by Tess have mentioned, that's also another example, right? We can actually, without using lines of code, create AI that the humans or machines can actually uh, utilize for, for useful applications. I think that's also something that can be interesting to consider, right? As to just broaden the scope of AI uh, AI shouldn't just be repetitive operations done by a computer, right? I think that could be um, hopefully mind expanding, right? For the community to, to consider. And naturally for the AI scientists that are familiar with lines of code to also inform um, material scientists like myself and others, right? Well, what else can we do with our materials that can make existing computer systems or machines more, more efficient or more useful? Right. So I, I want to hear from all the panelists on this. So uh, uh, maybe uh, Ravinder, if, if you want to kind of share your thoughts. Oh, well, as I mentioned in my presentation, Carmel, uh, uh, putting AI or let's say machine, uh, realizing these machine learning algorithm in the hardware itself, which is material and you know, transistor circuits, et cetera, will allow us to reduce a lot of data. And it also allows us to, to use the resources efficiently. I mean, you have less number of devices. Ben mentioned in the end of his presentation about electronic waste. It has you know, implications in many ways. So you are not using the computational resources away from the skin. It's just the part of the material and machine learning all put together. You can call it computational electronic skin or computational material leading to you know, lesser amount of data and then uh, uh, it will eventually help us overcome the challenges, traditional challenges such as latency. When you are talking about uh, you know real uh, time interaction with with uh, touch based interaction. Great, and I do want to get back to this question of sustainability as it relates to, to the work that you're doing. So maybe maybe as a follow up, uh, Marsha, you're on mute. We're using, uh, yeah, thanks. We're using AI in, in sort of a, a different way. You know, I talked about the challenges with the communication uh, effort that we have the two pieces, right? How do you, how does the user accurately perceive the cue? And then how do you map the information to that you want to convey to the cue? And that's where we've leveraged some AI machine learning approaches. You know, I came into this project thinking, oh, we'd want to do something intuitive. We would want the cues to feel sort of how the, the phoneme sound, but it turns out if you can rely on large data sets that tell you about the accurate perception of the cue and also existing data sets about auditory confusion of phonemes, you can minimize errors by mapping in such a way that you uh, avoid those sort of um, cl close, uh, either close haptic perceptions or, or close 
uh, phoneme uh, perceptions. And uh, so I think this is, this is an area where we're interested in looking more about using uh, machine learning and AI technologies to help with that mapping uh, process. Right. And that also brings up this you know, question of data sets, which uh, actually there was a question from, from the audience that, that related to that. So I wanted to pull that, uh, maybe we can discuss that in a bit. Tess, I'll give you the final word on, on kind of merging the, the materials and the, and the AI. Yeah, I think for me, it always becomes a question of scale. When you scale up your tactile sensing, you get so much more raw data. And then when you scale up uh, your input to a, like a neural network, you get like the scale just gets out of control so fast. So I think it's important to make sure we're designing functional materials that can kind of keep this under control. So it can be interpretable and usable and not, um, and also sustainable. Cause we know that the larger our models get the less sustainable it gets to train them and update them. Great. Well, I definitely want to get to this thing of sustainability, right? Cause that's, that's kind of the overall theme of this uh, you know, whole program. But um, let, let me get to, to some of these questions from the audience. And so I have a, I have a couple here. Um, um, Let's see. So, you know, back, back to this point of, of data sets. So, so Tess, you were saying in, in your presentation, and Ravinder, you kind of alluded to this also, you know, of this kind of almost absence or need, you know, for these large data sets, you know, related to uh, tactile sensing and robotics, kind of analogous to what we see in computer vision. Um, but with that said, I mean, have there been uh, efforts and attempts at, at creating these open data sets uh, for, for skin interaction? Yeah, absolutely. There, I didn't want to imply that there are none, but there are none at the scale of like ImageNet. And so often we see the data sets come from one lab, one sensor with some like set finite number of objects or uh, actually for the question in the group for texture, I found one that only has only it has 12 sets of texture, which is a fantastic starting point. But they often don't represent the kind of diversity we need to create general models. Um, so I think, yeah. People are ca catching on to this idea and we are gonna see a lot of interesting work in the next five, 10 years. Very cool. Yes, I, I would agree with Tess, you know, this is, uh, we have for other sensory modalities, data sets are available, but that sensory modality is uh, is in that sense lacking. And, uh, and I can see the, uh, there's a lot of catching up going on now. Right. So, so this next question, this is actually from Marsha uh, from the audience. Um, about TASB, um, and so you know, you know, really cool uh, implementation there. And you know, I found it interesting how you can kind of, uh, as a surrogate for the sense of you know pressing a button or pulling, you can basically just squeeze the wrist, right? And and it's not intuitive, but you know, it, apparently it works. So, um, you know, in, in terms of you know how how TASB works, um, what what do you use to to track? Do you do you track the, the fingertip location and bend bending? And if so, how? Yeah, so when we initially started this, we were using hand controllers um, that, you know, commercially available come with the VR displays and, and they can track hand positions. Um, but you're sort of forced into the pose of holding the controllers. And now there's much better um, hands free, you know, controller free hand tracking. And that's what we're uh, relying on. So we're able to, to directly get that information from the commercial uh, system. Yeah, I guess I, I want to also um, kind of respond to your your comment about the squeeze. So I've got a, a, a colleague over here at, at Baylor, a neuroscientist, Jeff Yao, and uh, he studies touch perception. And I was telling him, oh, we've got this device and it squeezes and it vibrates and it feels like you're pushing a button. And he's like, mm, yeah, sure. Brought him over to the lab, 30 seconds into the demo, he's like, I'm a believer. It is really compelling um, how this, and I think this is an advantage of the VR environment that you can really play with the proprioception that a person is experiencing as they push a button, the visual feedback they're getting that's in conflict with that, and then these haptic cues that are overlaid. And so it's this multimodal kind of approach that I think really um, is key to the success of, of TASB that we've seen. We're starting to take this device now to other applications, so we'll be using it for prosthetics applications as well. I'm interested to see if, if it is as compelling when interacting with real, envi real environments and real objects. Um, but yeah, I, I guess to your, the point you raised earlier of what has facilitated these advancements and, and the hands, uh, the hand tracking in VR um, hardware really made this project possible. Excellent. Well, yeah, and, and please keep them coming to, to the audience in, in terms of questions. So again, just um, click on that tab for video uh, wall uh, and then post your uh, questions there. 
Um, so, so we brought up a number of times now sustainability, and and uh, I, this is something I want to hear from all the panelists. Uh, but I'll start with uh, Benjamin, just because this was you know called out in, in one of your slides. Um, and so I kind of am, am curious to kind of hear just a little bit more about your your um, perspective on how sustainability relates to, to kind of a lot of the, the approaches and material technologies methods in, in robot sensing. Yeah, I think, you know, frankly, at the rate we are consuming technology, right? Uh, we, are, we now each person have multiple cell phones, probably, right? Or devices. And I think if you think about what happens when we need the next upgrade, what happens to these devices, I think there's many, many strategies. Uh, naturally, one strategy is to recycle them. Uh, but what if they're broken, right? Are they, can they be easily repaired? I think that's been, you know, very challenging from a, some a supply chain and, and all this. So, which is why we are sort of taking a look at nature and see how we can design materials that can be actually part of a circular system, right? Or having some uh, performance capabilities like human skin that can heal over time if you have some damage. And that has been the focus of uh, where I think you know, it could be another uh, arrow, right, uh, that we can use to address this challenge, right? It's not going to change overnight. I don't think we can see self-repairable systems or materials being used immediately. We do see some, but as, as all technology um, tends to take some time to kind of diffuse through their society, I think we need to start to accelerate that thinking because otherwise we will be ending up with a, a lot of electronic waste that are in landfills and pollute the environment, right? So having the ability to engineer new materials that can give that kind of recyclability and repairability at the nano level, nano scale level uh, is, is very exciting. I think a uh, new frontier for many people to look at. Um, that's sort of how I see it, like creating that circular economy almost, right? Building batteries that we can recycle easily are building tech devices if you, if you break your phone screen, right? You don't even need to repair it because just leave it overnight or in the sun and it repairs. I mean, what, what kind of uh, world would that be, lo be looking like? I think that would be interesting to really explore. Right. No, Very definitely. futuristic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no. I mean, it sounds futuristic, but I mean, you're making great progress towards that. And, you know, uh, so, so I think it definitely is attainable. Um, so I don't know if other folks have, have kind of thoughts on, um, you know, I can think about self-healing also, you know, I've seen, uh, you know, more and more interest in using just natural materials for, for uh, you know, creating a lot of these devices and electronics and technologies and materials that can be grown. Um, and uh, so I, I don't know if other, other folks, we, we actually got another uh, question here from, from the audience. Um, so most people have anything to, to say about the sustainability part. Um, I, I did actually want to also just ask quickly about kind of the mass reproducibility and, and, and the mass manufacturability of all of these technologies. So maybe we'll start with TASB uh, and then the rest, if you, if you want to kind of share your, your thoughts also. So Marsha, uh, what can you comment on in terms of how TASB could eventually be mass produced? So I think, um, you know, we, we talked about wanting to sort of shoot the gap between like low cost hand controllers that vibrate and high end haptic gloves. TASB is a high-end device. It's got custom uh, brushless motor and a, a very uh, intricate uh, mechanical design. We've also incorporated real-time force sensing so we can do closed-loop force control. We've done a lot of um, investigation into whether we get more reliable perception of cues if the cue is position control versus force controlled. Um, so TASB in its current form is probably a sticker price of uh, several thousand dollars. So maybe not on the mass production there. Um, but we're looking at, um, again, this idea of if we can tolerate lower fidelity or, or less consistent delivery of cues, um, can we do this with, with cheaper technology? Um, and so I've got a, a graduate student in the lab right now who's exploring off-the-shelf um, devices like ERM motors instead of linear resonant actuators, using just servo motors to achieve squeeze instead of the complex mechanism. Um, these are all done with just uh, things you can get at the hobby shop and, and put together yourself. So I think it, you know, it depends on sort of what uh, tier of, of fidelity of feedback you want, but there's certainly the potential for, for mass production of devices like this. Right. Ravinder, how about the, you know, some of the um, uh, skins that you're developing? I mean, you talked about these like, you know, the semiconductor based, you know, uh, uh, fabrication and this kind of wafer transfer approach. Is that, is that also amenable to, to mass production? 
Oh, well, uh, that's true. Uh, we have recently demonstrated a role uh, version of these printed techniques. And it also fits into the previous topic that we discussed in terms of sustainability. So we are using a resource efficient approach. So use as much as needed. And to get the functionalities, you merge the functionalities. As an example, we discussed about merging material and computation together. But I also presented merging the energy and touch sensing together. So using the same device to do many things then uh, so that way you can reduce the number of uh, uh, devices you need to, or you can, for the same device, you can have multi multiple functionalities. Right. It could be used, the printing technique could be used to print solar cells, high efficiency solar cells based on silicon, single crystal silicon in this case, or the same uh, could be used to print a, a neuronal transistor or, or simple uh, CMOS digital CMOS based circuits. Right. Okay. So, so it kind of, you know, and, and, you know, this ties into this concept of can, you know, can we do more with less data, you know, that, okay. you know, relates both to the kind of the practicality in terms of manufacturing, you know, but in terms of, um, um, you know, sustainability and, and you know, materials usages. Um, uh, Tess, a couple of, a couple of questions for you kind of as, as this relates to kind of the magnetic skin. So, um, you know, number one, I mean, you know, you know, on this, you know, point of, you know, doing, you know, more with less, I mean, are there kind of restrictions or kind of requirements in terms of spatial uh, resolution? Uh, so, so that's kind of a, a one question. Um, and then, and then also, you know, just based on the fact that you're kind of using, uh, um, uh, you know, AI to, to establish these mappings between deformation and changes uh, in, in magnetic field. Um, you know, if you are to say swap out these materials or if the material gets damaged, um, uh, can you use the same, you know, neural network, say, or, or kind of classifier or, you know, trained model as before, or do you have to kind of basically recalibrate the whole system? So two questions there. Um, yeah, uh, but, but interested to hear your comments. Yeah, uh, maybe I'll take the second question first. Um, so... For, okay, so for sustainability, one advantage is that um, you don't have to replace the whole system. So we wanna minimize the generation of e-waste overall because we know that the skin has a different lifetime than the you know, tried and true electronics. So that's one way we can reduce waste. Um, as far as the neural net model, it does generalize two new samples. So that means you don't have to retrain your network and it means that you only have to replace like half of your system. Um, I can see in the chat that the question also mentioned how like using a neural network is different from calibrating the sensors. Um, I consider calibration to be more of a pre-processing step for each individual sensor before you can move on to your useful information. But you don't need to do that with the neural network. We already assume that like the, the general calibration model has been included. So it's kind of like a one-step process. Um, I think I had two more thoughts on sustainability. One idea I've been toying with is like, what if you have one high cost, fully sensorized robot that we use to learn the new environments or learn the new task that comes through. And then we can actually apply what they've learned to lower cost, less sensorized robots that can repeat um, this kind of informed in, the, in an informed way. So for sustainability, I always think about on the scale of how robotics with tactile sensing lead to adaptation. So that means we don't have one factory that's really good at doing one thing we can have one factory that's really good at doing 12 things that can, you know, suit the needs of its immediate surrounding community. And if we, as we change our needs, we can actually just upload software and not have to change any of that hardware. And so that's how I view sustainability. So even though Reskin is low cost, it's not the best sensor as far as spatial resolution goes. I want to hesitate before we just create a bunch of them and instead ask like, what do we need to get um, like, the impact we need for our communities. Thanks, Tess. So, so something I do find really exciting about, about the work that I've uh, seen from you all um, is that you know, you're not satisfied with just making these, these kind of new architectures and new sensing technologies. I mean, you've been doing a lot of work in terms of validating with human subjects. So uh, I'm kind of curious in terms of, you know, in these human subject studies, you know, have there been things that you've learned that kind of broke your assumptions, you know, and, and maybe influenced basically how you revisit 
design of these technologies. Um, so happy to start with with anybody. Yeah, I'll I'll take the bait on that one. Um, so one of the things that I guess is uh, always you know revealing and frustrating about human subjects is is like you know we our models are only so good. You know we're aware that there's these different mechanoreceptors. Um, in, in the work with missive, where we combined stretch, squeeze, and vibration all together, we really thought we would have this multiplicative um, ability to uh, transmit uh, more and more information to the user, um, and, and that it would just be sort of a, a limit of um, Q set size. Uh, we learned that there's a lot of um, masking or interference going on in the perception of the cues. So depending on how close together you apply them on the skin, depending on where on the body, that was, that was more intuitive, right? We have different density of sensors on the skin in different parts of the body. So you need to take that into account. Um, but the, the squeeze and stretch were really difficult for users to discern. And to the point that if, if we were squeezing at all, they couldn't sense anything else. Uh, it's partially why TASB does not incorporate a skin stretch cue because the squeezing effect of TASB would would probably um, completely mask that for the user. So I, I, I think it's this, you know, how does the limits of human perception come into play here? Um, and how do we incorporate that knowledge into the design process? You know, as an engineer, I want to sort of get into the hardware and the controls, but there's always this piece of um, how is that information sensed, processed, and acted upon? Um, and how is that going to affect the overall system behavior and performance? Uh -huh. um from practical point of view, one problem with the uh, with the skin is uh, it's it comes in direct contact with objects, and that leads to a lot of wear and tear. And we assume that it's uh, whatever technology we talk about, whether soft materials or you know the electronics, it is prone to wear and tear. And it's quite challenging to to have a skin that continues to work for a long time. Uh, we we noted this problem. Uh, um, and then we also explore solutions such as, you know, embedding these sensors in 3D printed devices, 3D printed prosthetic hands, 3D printed limbs. As an example, you print the, the structure in such a way that sensor is intrinsic part of the, of the structure itself. You print plastic and then print metal and make a capacitor and then print plastic again so that sensor, the finger itself is a sensor and uh, it does the job. Again, merging the functionalities, and uh, and that's that's something we learned uh, while while uh, you know using this. Looks like we lost Ravinder just for a moment here. Uh, hopefully you can you can get back on. Um, so Benjamin Tess, uh, kind of th uh, thoughts. Uh, so maybe Benjamin, uh, kind of anything that in your in your human subject studies you learned that that kind of surprised you and and maybe you had to kind of maybe go back to the drawing board or you know make some new new adjustments to your designs um well we actually kind of we we have done more human subject studies on sort of more wearable devices trying to understand uh, the health parameters right so less on the tactile modalities right so those we partner with uh, somato sensory scientists uh, but what was interesting um uh, to me was that you know when when, when we perceive uh, objects of different uh, sensor modalities, right? Uh, for example, you can have hot or rough and, and so on, right? You can, even despite the very poor, you know, I would say per, almost performance compared to electrical systems, right? That we can design, right? we can make them a thousand times faster. Uh, yeah, the ability to quickly learn and sort of um, be very plastic about the, the world, right? Uh, was very intriguing. Uh, to me, and so I think that that something that right now we are still haven't really created um, devices or, or systems, right? That can mimic that plasticity, almost on the fly learning, right? And that is something that I find very intriguing. Uh, but at the same time, you can also trick your 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 human subjects, right? Uh, through a certain visual cues. Like for example, you must have heard of this rubber hand uh, rubber hand phenomena, right? Where if you have a rubber hand by looking at a rubber hand that looks almost like your hand. And if you take a, a knife to try to cut that hand, the person immediately kind of uh, jumps, right? Because he thinks that's his own hand. I think that's 
um, very interesting, especially for uh, metaverse related applications that we can use visual cues to uh, prompt uh, the human subject that has been trained through many years, right? To kind of anticipate that. And right now, I don't think we really have that uh, systems that can do that, artificial systems that can do that anticipatory aspect uh, very well, right? Of course, you can write code, but it's still not something that's dynamic and, and learned, right? Uh, that there's something that's intriguing um uh yeah right and, and so we're, we're pretty much at, at time i don't know Tess, if you had any kind of closing thoughts on on you know this you know issue of, of maybe not even with human subjects but any kind of assumptions that that you had that actually like you you realize through through experience uh that actually doesn't apply yeah, just a really short one. Again, I haven't led any formal studies with user subjects, but my subjects tend to be the robots. And my takeaway is that you can do a lot with just a little bit of touch information, just making your system a little bit more multimodal with a little bit more information, not something crazy high spatial resolution can actually add quite a bit of functionality to your system. So as we're scaling up, I think it's important for us to ask, what do we really need to achieve, you know, whatever your design use cases are. Right. Yeah, I would like to echo that really also uh, from point of scaling, right? I mean, end of the day, we need to make technologies that people want to use, right? And have some value for. Uh, and then we can think about scaling. Otherwise, uh, we'll be scaling a technology that current, currently may not have a use yet. And that's something that uh, is, is tricky because at the same time, you need that technology to uh, create an imagination of what could be, um, but it may not end up solving an immediate problem. Right. And so that's something that I think uh, we can definitely talk to more uh, disciplines uh, to find out, right? Whether it's the doc doctors, you know, from medicine or for, from the environment, right? Right. Excellent. Yeah. Well, that, that's a great, I think that's a, a great note to, to leave on um, and, you know, you know, engaging a wider range of stakeholders and, you know, this notion of, of can we do more with less, you know, and then how does that relate to kind of better, not just better performance, but kind of more sustainable uh, technologies and solutions. So, so these are all really wonderful thoughts. Um, I think we'll just uh, close. I think we have just, uh, I think we have a few more minutes left, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so uh, let's see if there's a question here. Um, are there uh, any sustainability applications that are enabled by the smart skin? You know, so the example here is like better sorting of, of mixed waste streams, for example. So, so is there anything uh, there that, that any of the panelists are familiar with? Well, I think there's some uh, aspects of recycling. I think uh, there's a uh, effort, I think if I'm not wrong, Google has sort of built uh, trash sorting uh, robots. Uh, they can sort trash, right? Whether it's cans or, or otherwise they can be recycled or not recycled. Uh, those could be applications where skin can come in. Uh, but I think the biggest challenge there is robustness because trash can be sharp and you can damage the skin very easily. So there you have a dilemma, right? You need intelligent sensing. Uh, you can use vision to compensate, uh, but sometimes vision is obscured by objects, especially when it's you know a mess, a pile of, uh, of trash. So I think there could be applications in recycling, uh, you know, uh, in terms of sustainability, or even up upscaling or upcycling uh, materials, right? And that's where maybe the robots can come in uh, to actually upcycle materials rather than just purely sorting. I think that could be interesting. Right. Yeah, one uh, uh, application uh, that I could see with tactile skin or touch sensing is, you know, sorting of biodegradable plastic from degradable plastic, which itself is a big problem. Even though all these bottles that we use, water bottles we, we buy, they have those, uh, you know, the sign marking, uh, whether that's degradable or not, but educating people is itself is a challenge and such technology could come uh, quite handy there. Right. Yeah, I like to imagine uses in agriculture. So if you had a robotic uh, system with tactile sensing that could, you know, care for multiple kinds of crops, then maybe we can have some sort of robotic farm in between like a uh, modern, modern farm and something uh, than a home garden, like something in between those two extremes. Right. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent point. Um... And, and connecting to that, connecting to what Tess said, if such uh, smart skins were made from materials which eventually degrade into, you know, use 
digital byproducts such as compost that would be even in for digital right digital agriculture right you, you broke up a little bit there but yeah we, we got your point that yeah if, if it's biodegradable you could almost compost the, the robots so so excellent. Well, we're at time right now. Um, and, and so I do want to uh, wrap up um, by again, thanking all of the uh, panelists. Uh, this has been really inspiring, you know, very thought provoking and um, uh, definitely to, to the attendees, um, you know, more than, you know, I'm, I'm sure the, the panelists will be happy to be in touch if, if you want to reach out to them individually. So, um, so I'll turn it back over to, to Gulam, um with with any closing words. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Carmel. And a big thank to uh, Marcia, Ben, Tess, Ravinder for joining us today and for this very exciting panel. And now we really encourage you to check out the AI for Good program online to see more robotic sessions that may be of interest to you. For example, on Thursday, the 31st March, we'll be discovering how robots are being used uh, in humanitarian health deployment together with the World Food Program and the United Nations Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. And on April the 12th, we'll be we'll having a session on urban robots towards a smarter and more sustainable cities in partnership with UN Habitat. And this is the end of this section of, the, of this webinar today. And now it's time for networking in the neural network with the panelists and participants for the next 30 minutes. See you all in a couple of minutes. And now I'll, I will give back the floor to Anna for the closing information. Thank you a lot. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions. Like and comment, share links, complete the satisfaction survey, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. After the 30-minute networking session, we invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits and poster boards, and build your personalized AI for good program. It was a pleasure learning with you today. See you at the next AI for good.